the 17th article of the Church of England is very interesting, which deals with the subject. He says this, this is part of the 17th article of the Church of England. The godly consideration of predestination and our election in Christ is full of sweet, pleasant and unspeakable comfort to godly persons and such as feel in themselves the working of the Spirit of Christ, mortifying the works of the flesh and their earthly members and drawing up their mind to high and heavenly things. Many other good things added, but I think that's lovely. And we pray that the Lord will lift up our hearts and minds to heavenly, wonderful things, to know our God. This is what Spurgeon said about the doctrine of election. He says this, when I first received those truths in my own soul, when they were burned unto me, as John Bunyan says, burned as with a hot iron into my soul, I can recollect how I felt I had grown on a sudden from a babe into a man, that I had made progress in scriptural knowledge from having got hold once and for all of the clue of the truth of God. So may the Lord help us to to gain the clue of the truth of God from this chapter. Now I'm going to share a screen, I trust it will work, so that we can be on the same page in the Bible and we'll progress uh, through six sections I've got. I trust we'll manage to do that between us. So I'm going to share. Okay, it says host disabled sh screen sharing. Is there anything, uh, a problem there, Ron? Can it be enabled so that everybody can see it? I can't hear you, Ron. You're you're muted. Uh, I'm on share screen. Oh, it's all right now. Yeah. I think, I think I should... Okay. Yeah. Can people see that? No, we can't see that. Can you see that? No. Okay. Try try it again. Screen sharing, okay. Screen. Yeah, we that's it. Yep, great. Um, can you see it now? Not we can yet. See a lot of stars. Is that what you want us to see? No, I don't want that at all. Uh, let's try this. It should be a PowerPoint presentation. No, it says Macintosh high definition. No. Uh, okay. Oh, there, we nearly had it there. Yeah, we had it and then it came back. You do it again. I'll do it again. Okay. Share screen. No. Is that it? It says started screen sharing. Yeah, they were on. Yeah. Yep. Right. Uh, for Israel's rejection of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. We're on. Okay. I'll, re I'll read that and I'll just minimize you all so I can read it myself. <laughs> right. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience. Bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, that I have, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now Paul is introducing a subject which is very dear to his heart. He's very sensitive about it. He doesn't actually tell us what it is in words because he doesn't want to upset the Jews, the Israelites, natural Israelites, physical Israelites. He himself, he says in a later chapter that he's a Benjamite, that he is by nature, he was born as, as an Israelite, and yet he has this grief, and the grief is actually described in chapter 11, verse 1, has God cast away his people? 
That's the concern. It would appear that the vast majority of his um, own nation had cast away, had been cast away, seemed as though none of them were Christians. It wasn't true. He knew a number, a remnant, and yet he had this grief that so many should not have any interest in Christ. So many of them were not, had no interest in being saved and uh, um, trusting Jesus Christ. Why, could, why was this so? And he said, look at the privileges they had. They had the covenants from God in Sinai. They, they were adopted as the children of God in the desert. They saw the glory of God, that uh, pillar of fire and that uh, presence of, in the tabernacle over the mercy seat. They had everything, the promises of God. And even from then, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were descended and above everything else the Christ was descended nat naturally, naturally from their seed and yet even though he's the blessed God they hadn't trusted him. He doesn't say all that but you see I, th I think the point clearly is this that if we have a real heart for the things of God we should grieve over the unsaved. In fact this is my sex point, my, my first two points really is, are this. The plight of the unsaved should, should not be something which is indifferent, and I'm sure we're not indifferent to it, but it should cause us grief. We see so many in our nation drawn away after so many things and uh, concerned only with their family, their selfish behavior, sex, drugs, uh, and, and the worst sort of behavior, and they have no interest in Christ. It should cause us to drive home the, the prayers to God that he would change these things. And that's how Paul felt. And, and he's, uh, the other point really to make is this, that family privileges are wonderful things to have. They were privileged in, in, in a way that no other nation has been privileged. And yet they didn't save them. Privileges don't save anybody. There's so many examples, aren't there, in the Old Testament of godly kings who had wicked sons and wicked son fathers who had good godly sons. It's a work of God. And so we should understand that that's how Paul is describing things, how the grief that uh, should drive our hearts to pray and pray, that people we know in the family and, and so on would be saved. Now, then goes on, as my heading is, Israel's rejection and God's electing purposes. So we'll read these verses. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor they are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, this is a very careful argument, and I'll try to go through it slowly enough so we can get the gist of what he's trying to argue here. The first thing he's, say, he's saying is this, the true Israel aren't necessarily naturally born Israelites. That's the point he's making here. If that was the case, all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be converted Christian people because of natural birth. But he said he never promised that. And he gives the example of Abraham. Abraham had two sons. He had Isaac and he had Ishmael. And Ishmael was not chosen. Israel was not a Christian. They had no interest in the things of God. So mere descent from other believers does not make us Christians. But what happened was that it was through 
the promise. The promise of God was to Isaac. Isaac was born by a miracle. A miracle that couldn't possibly happen by nature. Here was a man nearly a hundred years old with a wife of 90 who had passed the age of bearing and yet a miracle happened and Isaac, the son of promise, was born. Now what do we draw from that? We draw from this the fact that God doesn't promise natural born but he has to work a miracle of grace in our hearts. That's what causes us to be saved. It's nothing that we have. It's God's miraculous birth from above through the Holy Spirit. So Sarah had the son at the time of promise. But that's two different sons from two different mothers. So he has not, not only that, but listen, think of the example of Rebecca. Rebecca had two children in her womb at the same time. She had Jacob and Esau. And before they were even born, God had said that the, young, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So we think of this and we think, this is, this is a little hard, is it not? But uh, I mean, after all, and some people argue, wasn't Esau a nice chap? And wasn't uh, uh, Jacob a bit of a slimy, slippery character? Yes, that's true. Both of them were sinners. If we ask the question, did either of them deserve to be chosen and to be converted? The answer is no, none of them did. All of both of them were sinners. And that's what he's saying in verse 11. The children, before the children were born, God's purpose, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. So our salvation doesn't depend on our good works, that's quite clear. And it doesn't even depend on our heritage at all. And, and people say, well, this is a bit harsh, isn't it? Jacob I have loved. Why did he love Jacob? And, and some of them will say, well, some will argue, well, it doesn't really mean I uh, hated. It. it means loved less. But if we take this spiritually, am I, convert, am I a, a Christian today because... God love me a little bit more than the unsaved or somebody who's not converted it's just loved a bit less that can convert it that can't be true surely there's a vast distinction between a saved man who's going to heaven through God's wonderful grace and somebody who's bound for hell it's not just a matter of uh, of a small difference in degree of love it's a fact, if you look at those verse, that actual verse in Malachi, it's quite clear that he had, Jacob was chosen not for any good in him, but purely out of his grace. Now, I would say that must be the, the answer, because uh, we'll come on to it in a minute, but let's look at the lessons first. The lessons clearly from that passage are this, that God's word never promised the natural descent made a person a true Israelite. There's a true Israel, the true Israel of God, are a spiritual people. God promised through Abraham there would be a multitude of nations, and through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. True converted people come from all nations. They make, up, make the true Israel of God. God hasn't cast away natural Israelites, but the real Israel of God, aren't the natural people but the spiritual people and God's people are, are there as are such by a promise by God's wonderful grace they've been born again from above he said that didn't he Christ said that to Nicodemus you must be born from above or born again must be a new principle put in our heart and we look at ourselves and we say I agree with that I know that in myself there's nothing that would ever cause God to choose me. He must have done it just out of his love. God elects people to salvation before the foundation of the world. That's what the scriptures say. And this election is God's sovereign purpose. It's not based on good works that we might do or faith that's foreseen. 
the scriptures tell us that faith is not in all people. Uh, and faith is a gift of God, not a works, lest any man should boast. None of us can say I'm a Christian because I did this and I was good and I, I, I trusted Christ. No, he causes us to do these things, all the work. Salvation is of the Lord. That's a, the most wonderful truth that we could ever have. Now, I know that this, we can believe that this is the, the right way of looking at it from the next section, because the first objection that Paul, if you like, raises, uh, if you like, he's thinking, how will people react to this? And this is how they react. What shall we say then? Is there in right, unrighteousness with God? In other words, is it really fair? It's not fair, is it? But what Paul says, and what we should believe is this, certainly not. There isn't unrighteousness with God. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For well, the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show you my power, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. And if, I, if I ask us all, do we deserve mercy? The answer is no. Mercy is, is never deserved. Mercy is something given to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And that's what his, Paul is saying here by the Holy Spirit. I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. God's ways are higher than our ways. We can't dictate to God and say, that's not fair. You shouldn't have done it this way. But God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. He has it so that God is given all the glory and none of it comes back to us and we can't say I deserve to be saved I was a good person I did this and my faith was strong no God is given all the glory for my for my salvation I know I look at myself and I, I know there was and nothing in me that could have caused God to choose me and verse 16 really says that it's not of him who wills it's not our free will our decision for Christ that makes us a Christian no, it's God working in our wills, making us want to, to, to love Christ. God works on our wills. It's not of him who runs. It's not of our good works, how, how keen we are, how certain we are. No, it's of God who shows undeserved mercy. And you might say, well, what about unconverted people? How does he deal with them? So he raises the picture of Pharaoh, the example of Pharaoh. Remember how hardened Pharaoh's heart gradually became. Time after time, he was given an opportunity to repent. He had those plagues, and then the plagues were removed. And every time they were removed, he changed his mind and said, No, I won't let the people of Israel go. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And so on. He gradually got harder and harder. He hardened his own heart, and often God will add hardening if you like a permanent hardness to an unbeliever who's hardened his own heart so the lessons from from these verses is this that election god's wonderful choice before the foundation of the world which is gracious and kind is never deserved and i'm so glad it is not deserved because i can trust an unchangeable god because if it depended on my work and my works and my feelings well i'm down in the dumps one day and i think i can't be a christian today because i don't feel it and the day after i feel on top of the world and wow i'm a christian today i must have done something good no none of that feeling should be in our hearts all the glory is to god who before the foundation of the world chose us there's no matter of fairness if we think about it, remember the angels who sinned. What's happened to them? Has grace been shown to them? No, the Bible makes it clear that all of those uh, angels who sinned have been reserved for the blackness of darkness forever. It's horrendous thoughts. And yet God in mercy has taken some 
and passed by others. I don't know why that is, but I believe it because God said it's so. And it gives all the glory to God. So salvation is not because of my choice. It's not my good works. It's mercy. And God is patient with the unregenerate. Remember those awful Amorites in the land of Canaan. And God said to uh, uh, Abraham 430 years before it had happened that he wouldn't go into the land of Israel. It wouldn't become the land of uh, promise yet because he says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. They weren't as bad as they could have been. He was giving them grace. He was giving them time to repent and change. He gave them 400 years and more to change. God is very kind with the unregenerate. He gives them the opportunity to repent. That he uses even their hardness to display his power and glory. This is a wonderful truth. The Bible says in the Psalms, God causes even the wrath of man to praise him. What an amazing God we have. What a great chapter, great theme we're considering that my salvation all comes from God. And that's where it's safe because we have an unchangeable God. But we must move on. There's another objection. So we've had, it's not fair, but there's, there's, there's the sort of fatalistic arguments in this next section. You will then say to me, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? In other words, if God's decided in advance, I don't stand a chance. Might as well give up. No, he says, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honour and another for dishonour? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even on us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Interesting to see how he answers this objection. He answers the spirit in which it's asked. Who are you, a man, to uh, speak like that against God? What he's saying is, God is so far above you and I. How can we talk to God and tell him why he should or shouldn't have done things? And he brings the picture of the potter. He says the potter makes a lump out of the clay. The, pot, the clay doesn't talk to the potter. So why have you made me like this? He says the potter's got the power to make anything he likes out of the clay. Some of it might be some beautiful vessel for drinking and for honour and a beautiful place on the table in front of the king. And yet another one might just be almost a throwaway vessel, just for occasional use, and once it's unclean, it's thrown away. God has a perfect right. God is sovereign. He's in control. He knows what he's doing, what he's doing. And he shows, it says here, verse 22, what if God, wanting to show his wrath, he's now talking about how he deals with those, what are, those who are called here vessels for dishonour or vessels of wrath. The vessels of wrath. Now, you might worry about the, the phrase prepared for destruction. But I don't believe that means God, in advance, prepares them before they even existed for destruction. No, they're prepared by their own hardness of heart, by their own sin. It is their own work that prepares them for destruction. Because if you compare the phrase there, prepared for destruction, with verse 23, where it says, he prepared beforehand for glory. You and I who are believers, it's a beforehand preparation. It's not our preparation. It's clearly different. God has prepared us beforehand to receive glory and honour and immortality. What an amazing grace on the part of God that he, he has all this mankind before him. 
and in mercy decides to send Jesus Christ to become a man, to die for their sins, to take their place at Calvary, so that they might be vessels of mercy, that he might have grace and mercy on sinners, save them from the destruction which they deserve. All of them the same, all of them deserve it. There is only one Saviour, and yet in his mercy he saves some, but he doesn't save all. Of course we don't know who are saved and who are not saved, but we know that the person who saves can only be Jesus Christ. And if we preach to people, we preach Christ. Go to him. You haven't got the faith in your heart. Plead with God to give you the faith. You can't believe these things. Ask him that you will be changed, that your will would wish to take Christ as your saviour, that you might want to turn from your sins. God is able to grant repentance, to give faith. But we talk to people and preach to them, not that it, all the work depends on them, but that they're in danger because of their sin and they need to plead with Christ and go to God and plead with him that he might save them. And we take away all, if you like, all the hiding places that the sinner tries to hide in, all the excuses that people have, none of them are any good. There are no excuses. We're all guilty before God and we all need to go to Christ. That makes a big difference in how we think and preach the gospel. So what of our lessons? God has a perfect right to do what he likes with men and women. He's a potter working with the clay. God displays his rightful wrath. Wrath is not something, an awful characteristic of, of God. It's a rightful characteristic. Should he not hate sin? Isn't part of our problem as Christians that we don't sufficiently hate sin as God does? That we allow things in our lives that we should be ashamed of and dis are a disgrace to his testimony and his word? God is a pure, he's a purer eyes than to behold iniquity, the Bible says. His anger is, is right, and yet he shows great mercy and great patience with those who are fitted for destruction, giving them time after time. So why are they, why are they uh, unsaved? It's their own fault. They will not believe. They will not believe. God prepares beforehand the vessels destined for mercy. It's not their work. It's not their uh, doing that makes some vessels of, uh, for destined for glory. It's his great mercy. And this, as he says at the end, he's beginning to say what he's talking about now. This is for Jews and for Gentiles. It's not just natural birth, it's spiritual birth into the real Israel of God that makes Jews and Gentiles Christians. Now, he wants to prove this from Scripture. And so he quotes from the Old Testament time and again examples that prove that this is the way God deals in a sovereign way with our unbelievers. Verse 25, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a sea, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What are the lessons from this? God always planned to save a multitude of Gentiles. Those verses in Hosea, people who were not a people of God. Gentiles were not, in the Old Testament, largely invited to become believers. There were some. Remember Rahab? Remember people like that? Who, and uh, other people who came in during the wilderness journey? They were, became part of the people of God. Some of them even became in the descent. But largely, Gentiles were not among the people of God from the very beginning. Not, as I said, that all Israel were the anything but the outward people of God by circumcision, but there was always a remnant, a remnant that he 
decided that he would save them there, touch their hearts and make them new people in Christ. Even though they hadn't heard of Christ, they knew he was coming and they believed upon him. Abraham was justified by faith, just in the same way as you and I are. They, they were looking forward to a saviour. We look back to a saviour. God never said, said he would save whole nations, but he'd save a people for himself, a bride. That's a reference to the beloved. The people of God are one day to be his bride in heaven displayed. There'll be all the nations of the world will be have people among them who are saved and will be part of that glorious bride. And a remnant of the nation of Israel will be saved in exactly the same way as you and I have been saved by the grace of God. We're chosen in Christ. We are called by him in time. Our faith is put in him. We're justified freely by his grace. We're sanctified and one day we'll be glorified. That's going to happen not to all the nation of Israel, but in time to a remnant which has been added to all the time and right up to the, before the Lord himself returns. So he finally reaches his conclusion in these last few verses. What was the cause of the reason why what, what was the reason why israel had not been the people of god spiritually speaking he says verse 30 let's read them what should we say then that gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness even the righteousness of faith but israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness why because they did not seek it by faith but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, in La I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offence, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. You see, they pursued their belief along the lines of, if I work, if I work hard, if I obey the works of the law, God will be pleased with me. And yet in the early chapters of Romans, we hear time and again, by works of righteousness, none of us can be saved. It's by faith in the work of Christ, that wonderful righteousness. There's a righteousness of God. It's Christ's obedience in life and death, which is reckoned to our account. It's put into our bank account, if we like. We have nothing but sin. And he, uh, in that wonderful chapter 5, talks about the exchange christ takes our sin he's made responsible for it although it was not his own and he was pure and undefiled and, and, and perfect in every respect and yet he bore the punishment for all our sin it was laid upon him and we are given at the moment we're saved the moment we're justified we are counted just in god's eyes because we have the righteousness of christ his perfect work for us on Calvary in his life and in his death. Wonderful truth. But Israel's been blind to it. It won't be always the case. We have to read into chapter 11. There will be more and more uh, Jews added to the persons of those who will be uh, caused to repent and will be added to the church in a wonderful way so that that olive tree, well, sorry, I better not uh, take away anybody's, steal anybody's thunder from chapter 11. But it's a wonderful conclusion we reach at the end of chapter 11. God is, is amazing in what he's done, how he will cause both Jews and Gentiles to be converted. So what's our final conclusion? The Gentiles are saved only if they have the righteousness of God by faith in Christ. He says and the majority of Israel are still looking to be saved by their own good works. Many people in England are the same today. You meet them in the open air. Will you go to heaven? Yes. Why is that? Because I've done, I'm good. I'm not as bad as Joe Bloggs down the road. I, I, I've never killed anybody. I've, I've never done this. They have no idea of how sin sees, is seen in the sight of God. And they are offended at the personal work of Christ. I don't need a saviour. I can get there under my own steam. That was, was Israel's problem. That is the, the view of many religious people in our land today but nonetheless 
there is a remnant of Jews who are and will be saved by grace and faith alone. Read chapter 11 for that. So I'll finish with a few quotations from some people who have always believed uh, this particular, and I've lost absolutely everybody from view, but it doesn't matter. Uh, um, is everybody still there? Yes or no? I don't know. Yeah, we're here. Yeah, yeah. We're still here. We're still here. We're here. Uh, just, just a few quotations because you might think, well, who actually believes these things? Well, Tyndale said this. I've already had Spurgeon quoted. Tyndale said this, except you felt yourself brought unto the very brim of desperation, yea, and unto hell gates, you can never meddle with the sentence of predestination without secret anger and grudging inwardly against God. Therefore must Adam in us be well mortified and the fleshly mind brought utterly to nothing before you can bear with this thing and drink so strong a wine. Luther, the excellent, infallible and sole preparation for grace is the eternal election and predestination of God. That's Luther. What about 1380? John Wycliffe. Christ is everything in Christianity. To believe in the power of man in the work of regeneration is the great heresy of Rome. Conversion proceeds from the grace of God alone, and the system which ascribes it partly to man and partly to God is worse than Pelagianism. Pelagianism is, believes that there is good in man and that uh, everything's all right, uh, all will be well in the end because there's good in man. Of course, the Bible never teaches that. The Bible teaches hearts uh, and need our desperate need of mercy and grace from God. So I'll leave it there. Thank you all for your prayers.